Jones. Oh, I'm going down. Yeah, how you guys doing? When you're frying, when you're smoking dope. Have a good time. This one time and an old friend brought you in. You hear a punk rock song and sing along, everything gonna be alright. Tonight we're diving into the world of Timothy Ross Armstrong, a key member of iconic punk and ska groups like Rancid and Operation Ivy. Born in 65 in Albany, California, throughout his career he's been a driving force in the punk rock revival, infusing his lyrics with real-life struggles and social injustice. <laughs> With 39 recorded works, mostly full albums, he revived ska in the US, the Moloch in rock and roll, he became the Bob Dylan of punk, created a full-on rock and roll musical, won a Grammy with Pink for Best Song, and has generously released covers of his favorite tunes for over a decade on the internet. But the radio was playing, Desmond Decker was singing on the 43 bus as we climb up the hill. Nothing in common but the reggae drummer, so we all come from. One love at homes, I say, why even bother? Pick up the bottle, Mr. Bus Driver, please let these people on. You Armstrong's father, Donald, was a U.S. Army veteran from the Korean War and worked in maintenance for the city council and for the school district. But he grappled with alcoholism. His mother, Jackie, worked as a housekeeper and raised Tim and his two brothers, Jeff and Greg. As a kid, Tim's favorite pastimes included biking around Albany, spinning music records and attending music lessons at an elderly lady's home. But my first musical thing was when I was three years old, uh, Mr. Jones' song Rhythm, uh, Berkeley Hills, like an like a old school lady, like, hip, like a hippie lady, Okay. and would give like music classes, and my brother and I both went to it. Wow, and, three? Uh, and we just, yeah, from like age three to four, Five, and I just sing songs. Wow! And I play percussion instruments, and it was my best thing ever. One of my first memories is my mom coming in, like we gotta go now, and me crying, like I don't want to leave. We just played, we and we had like a set list, like Oh McDonald had a phone, or like Nick Knack, Patty Whack, give, give a, a dog, dog a bone, bone. like yeah. that shit. Like, but it was my best thing ever. So then I went from that to like playing trumpet, and then then Holy I went shit. to age twelve, I got guitar, I could learn. Got guitar. Once I got the guitar, I was like, fuck it, this is it. However, as a teenager, he grappled with alcoholism, much like his father. By the age of 13, he was already navigating a rough path on the streets of Albany, a struggle that created a divide between him and his mother. I started thinking, you know, I started drinking. I don't really remember too much of that day. Something struck me funny when we ran out of money. Where do you go now when you're only 15? When the music execution and the talk of revolution. Remarkably, both Tim and his father found sobriety later in life, strengthening the family bond. Jeff, Tim's older brother, introduced Tim to punk records like Ramones and The Clash, profoundly shaping Tim and his friends Matt's punk rock journey. And I got into it really young because my brother was seven years older than me and loved punk. Okay. So when I was in like seventh grade, I'm listening to shit that no one's even listening to. I was like, I was like an island on my own. You okay. Know? Even Matt Freeman, I mean, I recruited Matt Freeman and I got him a bunch of records to listen to. While Jeff worked on the Solano 7-Eleven in Albany, Tim and Matt would hang out in the parking lot, dreaming about music becoming their lives. Facing financial constraints, Tim began working before turning 18, often in pizza joints. He also sold stuff to hippies on Telegraph Avenue, a street close to his heart, where he also played his guitar for change when he was homeless. Well, I was there in the 
sky was blue You could find me on the corner of terrain And telegraph Avenue I was only 17 I knew what I had to do So I grabbed my left hand guitar And I headed out to telegraph Avenue With Matt Freeman, his closest pal, he ventured into bands like COD, Rat Pack, and Basic Radio, but without any success. In 87, he attended the inaugural show at Gilman Street, an underground music club that would alter his life forever. Tim and Matt Freeman traded toilet cleanups and garbage disposal for free show access and rehearsal space for their new band, Operation Ivy. Who's the best uh, ska punk band of all time? Operation Ivy. Me and Tim had his thing, you know, Tim is writing these like riffs, you know, punk rock riffs, ska riffs. They had Jesse's incredible lyrics. It's kind of a sense of, oh wow, there's no stopping them. They were just magical. They toured extensively across the US, sustaining themselves on the road, earning enough for gas and food. Tim's ambition all along. He even reconciled with his father, who built a large car box to accommodate their instruments while traveling. Well, Tim was living the dream. Green Day and AFI, Operation Ivy stood out as an iconic band emerging from the underground scene in Bay Area. In 89, they disbanded, leaving Tim disheartened in his mid-twenties, feeling his musical career had come to an end. Before I knew it, the whole thing got so fucking big. So Jesse and I, we met up to talk, you know. We just got a beer, went up to Northside, and he uh, he says, it's not the same no more, you know? I said, yeah, it's not, huh? And we both came to agreement we should break the band up, you know? They didn't become a globally touring band, but they influenced some of the best punk bands in the world and are still frequently covered from basements to gigantic stadiums to this day. said Operation Ivy and then like in parentheses last show. This song was once sung by a band called Operation Ivy. I know things are getting tougher when you can't get the top of the bottom of the barrel. Only a description, just an observation of the pitiful condition of our generation. That's the only love opinion through which we speak and never listen. Ceiling made of pride, vicious and so satisfied. Good was made of rage, pardon till the end. Always losing title with everyone we wait. Despite launching two more bands with Matt Freeman, one of which achieved success, the dancehall crashers, Tim struggled. We do have a tape out, it's called Say Cheese, it's a demo cassette that we just recorded. It's uh, six songs. Both 
post-breakup, Tim Armstrong fell into depression. Dyslexia, poor grades and low self-esteem left him with no sense of direction without his music. Alcoholism and drug addiction took control of him and he wound up living on the streets. He literally had no place to go, his mother kicked him out and he couldn't afford or even get the grades to attend college. Meanwhile, as Matt toured Europe with the band MDC, he observed other bands like Green Day or Jawbreaker, releasing albums and making a living from music, while Tim was left alone with his demons and nowhere to go. I was almost over, but my world was almost gone. But in a sudden rush, almost touch the things that I done wrong. My jungle's made of concrete And to the silence I can't feel But my aim is true And I will walk on through These mountains made of steel Between 89 and 90, he consumed over 20 beers daily He grappled with three overdoses Landing in the hospital And found himself without a home At times, sleeping rough on the streets I first night we broke up my drinking got really bad, you know. I would drink and drink and drink till I couldn't go no more. And I was fucking everything up. Tim's brother Jeff and Matt intervened in his self-destructive path, guiding him to a recovery center, the Salvation Army. While in the Salvation Army, Tim understood he needed to change his way of life in order to achieve his ideas. If other kids around him could go to college and have other types of jobs, he knew his only solution was through punk and through music. And what punk means to me is what punk means to, to maybe any of you guys, you know what I mean? For me, it's about I was always an outsider and a misfit my whole life. You know, my house was crazy, my dad was an alcoholic, my, my, my family were really, really poor. And it was an escape for me, like, like a place that I could go to. My wife would be like janitor, like my old man, like I don't want to be no fucking janitor. All I know how to do is play music and make records. And I, don't never want to do anything else inside my whole life except play music. I got no other skills except make records. And... He was fucking up, fucking up, fucking up. And finally, he went down and he got into the Salvation Army program, which was in downtown Oakland. You know, and he stayed there and, you know, it kicked his fucking ass. It wasn't, it wasn't bullshit, you know. I go up to Matt Freeman and I say, homeboy, I got a year sober. Let's do this. It's like a Rocky movie. Let's get to work. Uh, so here we are. Uh, While Tim kept sweeping the floors at Gilman and serving pizzas on Telegraph Avenue, Matt was driving a delivery van. At that time, Tim was living in a punk rock house with Brett Reed, the San Francisco skate punk kid who wanted to emulate Eric Sandin from NoFX, his favorite drummer. The three of them got together and started a band. They named it Rancid. Rancid wasn't like Operation Ivy, Tim will tell anyone who asks. And we didn't play Sky, he said. That will change later, but initially Rancid was straightforward hardcore punk rock. That's what Tim was feeling, he was sober, channeling all his angers and frustrations through his music. With the driving force of Matt Freeman, who musically lead the band. With Rancid, there's a thing about what happens when someone changes, but they're also sticking to who they are. It was Matt and Tim. I mean and people fucking dug it. <laughs> the 
they released their first EP through Lookout Records, a label created at Gilman Street that distributed Operation Ivy and Green Day. They were eager to perform live with a second guitarist, so they invited Billy Joe Armstrong to play as a guest at Gilman's, a show that is still considered truly epic today. Well, rant it! Not anymore. <laughs> There's Billy, our new guitarist. He's doing Joe over here from Green Day. <laughs> Fuck you. In 93, they signed with Epitaph, a then really small indie label run by Bad Religion's guitarist Brett Guritz, a longtime fan of Operation Ivy. But since they were left in the Gilman's label, people start calling them sellouts. And even on the internet, in 1993, that's right. We get signed to Epitaph, and a friend of mine was like, yo, they're talking about you guys signing to Epitaph on the computer. And it says like, Rance is selling out the East Bay to sign a big Epitaph Records. And I tell my friend, like, yo, who wrote this? Oh, I'm going I'm to step to him. And I'm like, what the fuck you got to say about me? You don't even, we haven't even made the record yet. And they're saying, it sounds, it sounds like Bad Religion. New Rancid Records sounds like Bad Religion. And we haven't even made the record and they're talking oh, about it. I say, and, and I didn't even know what the internet was. That's, that's OG trolls. During that same year, Lars Fredrickson joined the band as the lead guitarist. Matt Freeman was singing and my brother goes, hey, pause that for a second. Stop pausing. He goes, dude, it's, is that dude, is that dude like a big black skinhead or something like that singing? No, it's Matt Freeman or whatever. And he goes, well, listen, I'll tell you what right now. If you don't join this band, I'm going to kick your ass. I like to see me play music on shows. I'll play music, do it I love. I'm not shaded, no chunky running dry. I don't know, I don't know what is he else was playing till I die. He didn't participate in Rancid's first album, but the band shared their revenue with him so he could quit his job at Tower Records and become a full-time Rancid member. <laughs> This move led to recording their second album, Let's Go, which propelled them to mainstream success. In December 93, their first video played on MTV of the song Aina. The video was recorded in Tim's bedroom with Brett and Matt hanging out under his bed. <laughs> In the following year, MTV aired two more rancid videos, Nihilism and Salvation, both recorded at Lars' house. Now we make our videos for nothing. I mean, literally one thirtieth of what these other bands make their videos for. I mean, Brett Gerwitz gives me a little bit of money. If you trust me, I'm not going to go buy drugs with the money. <laughs> and we make a video. To me, that's amazing, you know, that MTV even plays our videos. Tim and Matt directed all the videos, which also reached European, Asian and South American audience. However, Salvation, the same song Tim wrote while working at the Salvation Army, would become their first big radio hit, achieving success in the United States. <laughs> That is a beautiful thing. In 95, Tim began composing ska songs again, and they released their best-selling album ever, and out come the Wolves, featuring hits like Time Bomb. Now he's out, he got a free, he got a, cool, got a car, 21 years old, he's running numbers from the bar, plays on FIFA, he's going to deepen, what he can move on, no, that kids are creeping. Ruby Soho.
and Roots Radicals. For every group of like five kids at a show that'll yell sell out at you, there's another 2,000 kids that right. love your music. So it doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, there are those kids that don't like you because you're on a certain label after a num certain number of years or you're so big. It's like those people never really liked you in the first place. These songs gained massive airplay on radios and MTV. They were following in the footsteps of Green Day and Offspring, breaking into the mainstream. Thank you for your time, your patience, your voices and your applause. This one's called Radio. I never fell in love, so why I fell in love with you? I never know what a good time was, so I had a good time with you. If I wanted to feel it, I won't get right in the music, scrap a lot for when music hits, I feel no pain at all. songs that, that have to do with what our life is about. I don't know. They're all true and it's all real and you know we just have cool lives. <laughs> in 98 came the first plot twist. Tim decided to delve into reggae and other Jamaican sounds, leading to the creation of an eclectic rancid album called Life Won't Wait. <laughs> While it didn't become a hit for the now vast legions of fans, this album was gold. By 2000, driven by Lars and Matt's musical preferences, Rancid took another unexpected turn, releasing a fearless self-titled hardcore album, a tribute to the underground fans of the band. <laughs> At the turn of the millennium, Tim collaborated with the UG pop sensation Cypress Hill and formed the band Transplants alongside his rancy roadie Rob Aston and the drummer Travis Barker. This venture became another commercial success, even gaining airplay in a shampoo commercial. <laughs> Additionally, he co-wrote eight songs with the pop artist Pink, leading to a Grammy Award for Best Song. By 2003, Tim had reached the peak of his commercial success. I said I'm just looking for 
By 2003, 10 years after being homeless and without any hope, Tim had reached the peak of commercial success and was now a magazine rock star. Things were looking smooth, but Tim still felt a void in his life. His heart. While on a US tour, Rancid connected with the girls from Bikini Kill, and Tim ended up falling in love with their drummer, Toby Vale. She and Tim mostly talked by phone as they were both constantly touring and eventually she broke up with him. During that time they start creating songs for each other, something however neither of them ever admitted. During nearly two years of non-stop touring and recording, Tim's life was a whirlwind while Toby carried on with her. Rancid's 95 album and Out Come the Wolves featured a track named Olympia, which alludes to the drummer, something Tim isn't here to acknowledge. What really inspired the song, I just wanted to have a song that I said, hanging out with Lars. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it started from. <laughs> As 95 come to a close, Rancid found themselves touring in Australia, where they play the New Year's Eve show, and, for Tim's displeasure, his ex-girlfriend was there too. In that night, Tim Armstrong met Bree Robinson, the singer for Sourpuss, and a new drama began in Tim's life. Brody, as she was known, had turned 17 that night and told Tim she was 19, as revealed in an interview with Angelica Albuquerque from the Brazilian music website I Have More Discs Than Friends. It was my 17th birthday, my birthday is New Year's Day, I was 17 and told him I was 19, he was so hot and so gorgeous and I was totally in love with him. As Tim had just turned 30, there was a 13 year age gap between them, which eventually impacted their lives in the upcoming years. Tim proceeded with the And Out Come the Wolves tour for another 8 months while Brody told her mother about him. Tim frequently communicated by phone with Brody and even flew her out during Rancid's Lollapalooza tour in the summer of 96. During that tour, which was also the first time they were together since they had met, Brody kind of disappeared with the musician Josh Holmes, which didn't sit well with Tim. 20 years later, Josh explained what happened. I met Brody when she was 17 and I was 23. It was her first day in the US after relocating from Melbourne and I was playing guitar in the screaming trees. She came up to me backstage and we talked for an hour and a half and I never forgot her. I didn't like Tim Armstrong so I lied and said I had made out with her in the hope that he would find out. <laughs> After this incident, Brody returned to Australia, leaving Tim silent for months, angering her parents who believed he had serious intentions. During that period, Tim had his only publicly known relapse. 
Only five days after stop touring, he was completely drunk in the dirt. And this time it was a long time experience on relapses legend that helped him. Mike Ness. We were always touring, then we stopped, then I drank. I still lived at the punk rock house. I just didn't feel like... It was like, what do I do now? He picked me up out of the dirt, put me to bed. It was humiliating to have Mike Ness put you in bed. Plus I was eating dirt, I fell in the dirt, I was so drunk. I mean, that's humiliating to go down that quick again. It's not romantic at all. Mike Ness to Tim. You drink like this and you're gonna die, or do something stupid where you'll end up in jail and also probably die. After he got a few months sober in January 97, when Brody turned 18, Tim called expressing readiness to commit, but she had to move to the US. He then wrote various songs to Brody, some of them displayed in 98's album Life Won't Wait. They married in a private weekend ceremony attended only by themselves and a witch. As Tim was launching his own record label, Hellcat, he signed with Brody's new band, The Distillers, who became a huge sensation, making her the new queen of rock and roll. Brody's drunken actions during the Distillers Canadian tour in 99 became another red flag for Tim. Things started to get worse for both of them. Brody wanted to embrace the hard life of a rock star while Tim was striving to maintain sobriety while pursuing his career. This prompted them to start marriage therapy. However, Brody grew increasingly unhappy and fell deeper into drug addiction. Tim's friends would inform him of her behavior, worsening the situation for the couple. In the 2000s, and as Tim's marriage was getting worse, Rancid launched a new album with Tim letting go all his anger and frustration, some claiming that he even had a song for Josh. As Tim put Rancid aside while focusing on the transplants, Brody would arrive home in the morning intoxicated and high, as she mentioned in an interview. She was living the immature life of a young teen and Tim had to cope with it. She claimed that the age gap didn't matter because Tim had the mind of a kid, however, it did matter, and she eventually grew tired of Tim's pressure. In January 2003, when she was 24 years old, she flew back to Australia to live with her parents. Tim, now 37, was once again alone, battling another demons. The next time he would hear from his wife was through a magazine. By June, she appeared in a US Rolling Stone magazine photo, sharing an intimate moment with Josh. Tim saw that, and then all went down the drain. One man's pleasure is another man's pain. One man's heaven is another man's hell. Got something. 
worse the times now they don't face me even if i look can act really crazy i wake down she betrayed me now my vision is no longer hazy well i'm very lucky to have my crew placed to buy me when she flew i've been knocked down beat down black and blue she's not the one coming back for you she's not the one coming back for you if i'm always If I fall back down, you're gonna help me back up again. If I fall back down, Rancid 2003 album Indestructible delved into Tim's relationship with Brody. It debuted at number 15, their highest sales in an opening week. This marked drummer Brett Reed's final recording before departing in 2006, being replaced by Brandon. Songs like Fall Back Down, Indestructible, or Ghost Band and Tropical London explored Tim's divorce, making it their most intimate work. Their track Trouble initially recorded but left off the album, earned a Grammy after Pink reworked and released it. After the album's release, Rancid took a break. And I think everybody should come check you guys out sometime. Hey! Hey! hey. Oh, you're welcome. Hey. See you guys later. Bye! Bye! Bye, Bye. 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 Somewhere someone's listening We're just standing here in the clear I believe, I believe we're very near This is awakening, the sound that we said Somewhere someone's listening One of Tim's main characteristics is his songwriting. Since childhood, he would spend time with notebooks and a guitar, creating tunes that evolve into complete songs. This 88 recording showcases how some guitar improvisations later transform into full-fledged tracks for Rancid. Yeah, that feeling I get singing, I know what I know. Said if you wanna run away, then you better start to go. Don't let them vote, then you better come in. The color they are reaching now is so fake. You're drunk again. And even the transplants. We trust in you. We put out a helping hand. Come for an answer. It won't give you a ride. We're looking for fair. Another notable aspect of Tim's songwriting is the authenticity in his lyrics. Over the past 35 years, he has been chronicling his life across all his projects, sometimes delving into intricate details. With the dark, with the look the skyline Whilst I cross the city, I fall in For I want to go As many girls outside, but I want to go Take on fire I fell in love with you. I fell in love with you. I fell in 
know what a good time was, so I had a good time ago. If you want to get the feeling that you want to get it right, then the music's got to be loud. But music, it's not for no pain at all. You're now ready to play. Ready to talk to the face up for the seven. I'm just a quiet boy. Don't let the words of women. No good sense of play. Get a light there, but get a bad crowd. Call it up, but tell it hey. Everything's all right. Here it is. Here I am. Turn it up and fuck it out. This is evident in works like his first solo record, The Poet's Life, released in 2007. Wake up, you son of a bitch. I wanna know who you with. Why do you roll in at night at like six in the morning? I say, wake up, my love for mine. Why do you spend your time? With these guys who don't love you the way that I do And Rancid's comeback album in 2009, Let the Dominoes Fall It's all I've ever done, all I've ever known Just one day, one more show Make some music with my friends this song goes out to my father. He also has been telling the life on the East Bay from the characters that made part of his life to the buildings and, of course, the dynamic on the streets. Well, earthquakes shake and fires take from this view, I've seen it all. I taste it smoke as the hills burn and I heard the freeway fall. When there's nothing to say, just look into the bay and there's some things that just feel right. Later on he came up with the concept album on his band with Matt Freeman, Devil's Brigade, talking about the construction of Golden Gate Bridge, an iconic San Francisco infrastructure. With the money made from Outcome the Wolves, who sold more than 1 million copies, Tim founded Hellcat Records and started producing and launching bands that remain in our youth memory. From street punk to reggae, mostly thanks to the compilation Give Em the Boot. Yeah.
Team produced albums for AFI, Pink, Joe Walsh, Interrupters, and most lately the new Blink-182 album. In 2012, Tim went to Jamaica to produce Jimmy Cliff's new album, a reggae artist well known from the past that was kind of muted in the shelf. And once again he won the Grammy Award, this time for Best Reggae Album of the Year. He also produced movies like Larry's Dead. Got all these fucking scumbags telling you how to live your goddamn life. Larry was killed a week ago. I don't know, I guess I'd known Larry my whole life. He's my best fucking friend. We went through so much shit together. Feels like a year has gone by since I've seen him. Lib freaky, thy freaky. Charlie? Punk's not dead. I have more fun and am happier as a human being when I'm playing music. And of course, rock and roll theater, a full on musical with Dave Evok and Lars Fredrickson. Ain't that something? One man's heaven is another man's hell. Goddamn. And this is rock and roll theater. He also participated in some TV shows as an actor, like The X Files and The Twilight Zone. Those people who got killed, that was only him. Him? Who, who's him? X Files is one of my favorite shows of all time. People on the streets, the homeless, they get treated like trash. I was just trying to give those people a voice. The only way I know how. To art, not violence. I feel like Trash Man, his good intentions, he's just misdirected a little bit. I just want to scare him. Scare anyone that took a thing away from the homeless. You're responsible. If you made the problem, if it was your idea, then you're responsible. It's diabolical. Tim began crafting beats on a computer and invited Rancid's roadie Rob Aston to lay down some lyrics. Travis Barker joined in 2002 and just like that, Tim had a new band with his roadie and a soon-to-be Hollywood star. Tim remixed all the tracks in his basement and the band embarked on a 2005 warp tour. big screen TV. This is where we hang out. Like, we spend all our time back here. This is my man Tim Armstrong. Working out on the Warped Tour is essential. You gotta be in shape, you know what I mean? Don't you agree, Tim? Oh, yeah. That's how you, you stay sane on Warped Tour. Over the past 20 years, they've released three albums and one EP. Some of their songs are widely known in both the punk and hip-hop communities. The transplants, give it up, y'all. Check it out. Check it out. Big Snoop Dogg and I'm back in the house. Came from my stairs, now I'm running down low. I'm just to let you people know that I'm gonna steal this show. Put your hands in the air and wave from side to side. In 2012, he started the project Team Time Bomb with his new supporting band, The Interrupters. <laughs> Tim released hundreds of songs, mostly covers from his favorite artists, and he did it for free on the internet. And 
the Interrupters became the new revivalists of Ska with a huge end of team behind it. This is my family. 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 Yeah. In 2014 and 2017, Rancid released two more albums. Honored is all we know. Troublemaker. What you stand for freedom of speech? Well, this one goes out to you. I can still hear your voice. Hunter Graf have Kicking it in with the 2023 release, Tomorrow Never Comes. What's up everybody, we're Ransom! Here's a brand new song, it's called Tomorrow Never Comes. He has also played again with Jesse Michaels from Operation Ivy. A friend of mine up here, Jesse Michaels, we met in 1982. He was in SAG and I was in Contemplations of Death and we became friends. He went away to Pittsburgh for a few years, he came back and we formed a band called Operation Ivy. And uh, we wrote this song 34 years ago, it's called Sound System. <laughs> As Tim prepares to tour with Rancid alongside Green Day in 2024, in the year that now ends he is still highly praised whenever he plays. And this is a fact, he will live forever. Yeah, this is Sky 
radio busted in your face Kick it down, pump up your face Move down the rhythm, back up your soul.